My name is uh, Steve Smith. Um, I'm from Atlassian, and I want to talk a bit about um, understanding Git. Uh, this is what I call an intermediate level um, a talk. The idea here is not to teach you about the basics of Git. This is for the person who's got to the stage where they kind of understand Git, but then they've gone, oh yeah, that's fine, I'll rebase that, and then realize it's all gone horribly wrong. Um, this is that talk, that's the other talk. The way we're going to do this, we're going to go from first principles. Git's actually not that complicated. All the things it does to you are actually make sense, but only if you understand Git underneath the hood. So I'm going to go through some issues and workflows from base principles um, and show you how you can use that knowledge an understanding of how Git works underneath the hood uh, to get you out of trouble later on when you inevitably screw things up. And we'll actually go through some of the classic screw-ups, and we'll see who's li lying and who's telling the truth around here. So, first thing you'll hear, see a lot is this. Git is fundamentally a content-addressable file system uh, with a version control system built on top of it. That is true, but absolutely bugger all use uh, when you're trying to learn Git which is why people don't do that. So um, Emma Jane Hodgbin West, uh, Westby, if you ever get to see her talk, go, she's great. Uh, she talks a lot, um, and she talks as Git Merge last year, where a lot of interesting stuff happened. I'll hopefully mention some of that towards the end. Um, but she was talking about how to teach pe people Git. The reality is your average person is not trying to learn a content addressable file system. or doesn't want to hear about acyclic graphs. All right? What they want to hear about is, how do I get shit done now? I'm trying to migrate from this. Somebody is shouting at me about, why haven't you finished the latest feature? I thought this Git thing was supposed to make things faster. So they want to get their job done. They want to know what's the equivalent of a subversion command. How do you get your work done? How, why, why, why would you branch? What, how, uh, what do you do after you've branched? Things like that. And then eventually, um, you'll learn those things, and you'll, get, you'll move forward, you'll start to work more and more progressively. Um, but that, unfortunately, is not the full story. Eventually, you're going to hit a wall in Git. Um, you're going to get into an internal state in Git or in your pro 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 project repository where you don't understand what's going on anymore, or you've taken an action and something counterintuitive has happened, um, or you end up in a situation like this. This, by the way, is a recommended Git workflow. Don't do this. This is, um, this is Git flow. I can't recommend it. Um, it's a lot of people recommend it. Do, Git is great. A lot of people ask me, what's the recommended workflow? The recommended workflow is the absolute bare minimum required to get your job done. All right? This is the, we're supposed to be, doing, be programmers here. Okay? So um, the problem is you'll get into this state and Git. You'll get into a complex situation, and you will not be able to get out of it. At least you won't. Somebody will. So there's always that one guy. You might be a friend, might be someone in the team, the, the, the obligatory team smart ass. I've often pride, proud of my, pride of myself on being the team smart ass. And he is going to know how to do this. I presume you've all seen this XKCD cartoon. Everyone knows XKCD, right? Uh, you've all seen this cartoon, right? Okay, so this is, this is true. Eventually, you're going to hit this wall, and there's that one guy, and he's going to babble on about acyclic graphs and content addressable file systems and refs and hashes and all the rest. And then you go, you just look, shut up, shut up, just tell me what I need to do. And eventually, he'll tell you a bunch of commands you've never heard of before, and they will get you out of trouble. And you'll never know what the hell ha just happened. Now, the little secret here is that guy doesn't know the... Um, this, this guy, by the way, this is the dot text. I used to call a version of this talk, uh, be the dot text you seek. Um, so this guy, this bloke you've got to go and call, and he'll, he'll sort it all out, out for you. And he told you those magic commands. He doesn't actually know those commands exist. That's the secret of Git. He doesn't actually know that this weird this, uh, um, set remote or um, ls files or whatever um, exists, but he knows it must exist because he knows how Git works under the hood. He's learned Git from the base principles upwards, and from there he can extrapolate and understand that you must be able to manipulate Git in certain ways. And in extreme cases, you can go in there and hack it manually yourself, and I'll show you for reasons why in, in a bit. So the purpose of this talk is to turn you into this guy, or at least give you the tool to be able to become this guy. The idea being that Git is actually not that complicated, you just need to understand it from the bottom up. This guy, by the way, is an arsehole, because he could have just told you how Git works, but he wants to keep that, that uh, knowledge to himself and be the smartest guy in the team. So we're going to sort that out, out today. 
is we're going to jump into Git internals. We're going to do Git from the ground up. This is it. This is the absolute bottom level, starting at bits and bytes on the disk drive. At the bottom of the Git stack is the blob. In fact, really, everything else is just an abstraction of, of that and a couple of extra bits. At the lowest level, Git is a blob. Um, and we chain them together in interesting ways. In fact, there are only really three types of blobs. Everything else is just some variation on one of these types. We have blobs that are actually content. And Git doesn't really differentiate much between different types of content under the hood. In fact, at the lowest level, it has no knowledge about what a file is, what it contains, or what it does. It is nothing more than um, a blob of binary data that happens to be compressed, and we've taken a SHA-1 hash of it. Slightly higher above that, but also really a blob, and compressed in the same way, it looks much the same, um, is a tree. A tree is roughly equivalent to a directory in a Unix file system. In a, it can point to certain files and contain some information about them, like what their file name is and what their mode is on disk. Is it executable? Is it readable? Is it write writable, etc. Except it doesn't point to inodes on disk, it points to the hash of those other blobs. But because it can point to blobs, it can actually point to other trees. Therefore, you have a recur recursive file system. And the slightly higher level, the one that is not in a normal file system, is the commit. The commit contains information about changes over time. It points to a tree, which points to certain blobs that have certain metadata around them. That is Git in its entirety. So we're done now. We're all going to head to drinks a bit, uh, a bit early from now on. No? OK. So let's have a look at this on the, on the disk. We're going to create a, a Git repository from the ground up. We're going to start with an empty directory, and we're going to do a Git init. That gives us an empty repository. Now, I've glossed over something slightly here. It also generates a bunch of um, template data. It contains something called hooks. Um, these are actually unused, and they're merely blank temp templates. So I've actually skipped over that slightly, but don't worry about them. For all intents and purposes, a git empty Git repository is exactly that empty. In particular, we're interested in objects, the blobs. So we're going to do tree. So if you don't know um, uh, uh, what this is, tree is just a command in Unix that will do a recursive uh, run through a file system and just show you the contents of it. And as you can see, there are two directories here, info and pack, and nothing in them. So let's put something into this git repository. We're going to create an empty file. So touch here is another U Unix command. It'll either update the timestamp on a file, or if a file doesn't exist, it'll create an empty one there. So we created a file with zero bytes in it. And then we're going to add that to git. We're going to say, git, we want you to track this. And let's go back and have a look at what is in there. Now we have a single file. This is the blob I told you about, the contents of the file. Notice there is no information there about its file name or anything. All it is is it takes the contents of the file, adds a header onto it, compresses it with Zlib, and then takes a SHA-1 hash. That's it. Now, fun thing about that, if that algorithm applies everywhere, then every zero length byte file in the u universe where the same laws of math apply will always have the same address. Every file that contains only the letter A in ASCII, a single byte, will have the same address. This is what a content addressable file system is. If you have two files that have the same content, they are the same thing. They have different metadata, but they are, at the lowest level, the same thing. This is what a content addressable file system means. Of course, just SHA hashes and so on is not a useful way to operate this. In particular, we'd like to know what the file name is, etc. We'd like to know a bit more information about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to create our first commit. So we're going to do a commit with a simple message and have another look at what the contents of our Git repository are. Now we can see there are three files here. Now you notice something else. They're split up into separate directories. This is merely a file system hack. This is a way of spreading the load across the file system. Rather than having potentially millions of files in one directory, we're loading them off into a second layer. Um, this is the way of spreading the load. 
And a lot of what you'll see here is basically is shows that this was written by a guy who's a file system hacker and an operating systems hacker, Linus Torvalds, obviously. Another little quirk is we just split them up. We take the first two bytes of the um, oh sorry, first byte uh, of the uh, SHA-1 hash, and we use that to split the directory up. Annoyingly, it doesn't actually append it to the front of it, so you've got to kind of glue the two together if you're doing any recursive hacking. Hopefully, you shouldn't have to do that, but well, hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll be, be, be able to. Um, so what is in these three files now? This is the blob, the original empty file with the hash. This is our tree. This points to the object, and this is the commit that points to the tree. So it looks like this. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Git at its core. Everything else is abstractions on top of this core concept of objects. And some of the objects, by convention, have special data in them. Git understands trees and commits and blobs. Everything else is a, some sort of abstraction on top of that. The only other bit that we're missing here, which again is just another abstraction, is the idea of changes over time and commits. Commits are just, uh, changes are just commits with different pa parents. So a, a commit, the first commit has no parent. The second one has a parent that points back to the previous one, etc., etc., and so on. You have a root commit and then changes over time. They may point to different trees, which point to different versions of the file. As we modify files, they change and their addresses change so we modify the tree which changes the tree which changes the commit and, the, and so on in particular we can show this just by adding a little bit of data to that file we added and then we're going to add that in and say we want to track this change as well please and then we now see we now have a completely separate file again content addressable file system because the file is no longer empty it has a different um, content, it has a different address, and the next version of the commit will point to the new version of the tree, which points to the new version of the commit. But however, this is not an awful lot of use in and of itself yet. We've got the basis of a system that can track changes over time, but ultimately, and I cannot iterate this enough, I say this at every talk I do, software is written by humans for humans. Humans have to be brought into this at some point. Machines deal with hashes, humans don't work so well, which is why we bring in the next level up. Refs, branches, and tags. So, um, this is how we humanize and add a layer of version control sense on top of Git. So let's have a look at what a ref is. A ref is just a pointer to an object. Simple as that. In fact, it actually looks an awful lot like a, uh, a va variable, particularly in Java land. In fact, there's a lot of similarities to Java, and I'll point a few of those out along the way, or in terms of the JVM, more accurately. Um, a ref just points to an object somewhere in this chain of objects, or this you know big melange of objects in the system. Um, now, that's all I use by itself. Um, and particularly, I can point to any, any point along the, the way. But it's low, lowest level, it's an abstraction. You actually won't deal with refs very often directly because we build a couple of other abstractions on top of them, the most famous being the branch. The branch is a point to a commit. By default, it will be master. Master, or the head, um, is often called. A branch um, is often referred to by its head, uh, which is the latest, the end commit. So a branch is the divergence. Um, we have one that is a master, and that points to the end of the current mainstream of development. By convention, you don't have to do accept that. You can use whatever name you want, because it's just you know labels. However, at some point, we can decide that we want to change. We can create a, um, a commit that has two children, and we create a new reference that points to that, and that is all that the branch is. This is why branching is so fast in Git. It is nothing more than a, an abstraction. It's a pointer to a, a different hash, and we give it a name. So that's all a reference is. You also hear of tags. At the simplest level, a tag is just a reference 
that does not move. Um, that's the simplest one. I've glossed over that slightly. There is a special type of tank um, that actually points to a commit, which points to, a po to an object, because that gives you the ability to have messages and to sign things. But by convention, at the simplest level, if you add a tag with a name to a git, or to a git commit, that's all it is, is a, um, a file with a pointer to a hash that doesn't move over time. Branches move over time. As we make new commits, the pointer, the ref, moves along with it. Tags don't. The most common use of tag, of course, is to mark a release, or it can mark anything you want, though. You can create these by hand very, very easily indeed. But the normal convention is a tag normally points to a release. So again, let's drop down into the lowest levels again and have a look at this. We're going to just create a tag called um, a tag. Um, and we're going to create a branch called a branch, because I'm having got a lot of imagination. Um, and we're going to look at a different directory underneath git, the .git file directory, and call, uh, call refs. Inside that is heads, which is actually just another name for branches, and tags. And you can see all they are are just files. In fact, we can use cat. Cat just blows, just blasts out the contents of a file onto the screen. As you can see, it's just a pointer to a reference, to a, to a hash. So again, this is why branching is so incredibly fast in Git. It is basically almost a no operation. It is just writing a handful of bytes to a file. Um, now, at this point, I'm going to go off, jump slightly forward into an area which does cause some trouble because it is relevant. We're getting slightly ahead of ourselves here, but it is relevant to the current uh, subject at hand. What is a reset? How many people have done a reset? How many people fucked it up? <laughs> the rest of you are lying. I told you I was going to find out who the liars were. We will come to this. I'll tell you how to, how to fix this. It is a rite of passage. You will do this and you will fuck it up. Everyone's done that. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a jump forward. So if you decide to split after this bit, you go, you'll learn one of the biggest takeaway from this. Um, a reset, all a reset is, is it moves a branch, the, the reference that is pointed to a reference, normally a branch. So what you can do is say, I want to jump this branch, item number 10, the last commit did not happen. Now, there are some side effects to this. In fact, reset is quite heavily o overloaded in some ways, but um, it does have some side effects. What happens to the working directory, the checked out copy of the files, as opposed to the ones that are installed internally inside Git? Now, that's the side effects. It's where soft and hard and so on come in. Normally, everyone does hard and then goes, oh, shit, I should not have done that. But um, at the simplest uh, level, reset just moves a tag to a different point. Now, you can do some, it has some special language around it. That's what this little um, up carrots um, is for. That's a special, there's a little mini language in there that says you can, you can have a reference to an existing tag. So this basically says just move it back to the current pointer minus one. Just jump one back in the chain. But that's not important. You can do this, you can use raw hashes in this. In fact, we will do later when I show you how, um, how to get out of these problems. The problem is, of course, is that git, um, git stuff references backwards. These, arrow, these arrows, by the way, I've been told are a little bit misleading, but it makes a little bit more sense to most pe people. But what happens is commits point back to the previous commit. So nothing is pointing to that previous commit. So if I decide I've done the wrong thing here, how do I find out where I was before? Well, we know that Git was developed by programmers. We know that programmers screw up. And we know that programmers want to go and fix, scratch their own itch. So using the theory that I've um, espoused, that people don't really know Git, they just kind of work out that a command must exist. Presumably, there's some way of getting out of this trouble. And this is where reflog comes in. This is the bit where you can all run out. You, you know, if you know reflog, you saw, you, you've got the 90% of what I'm going to teach you here. Reflog is a log of references, and particular changes to references. So if you do anything through a git command, git makes a note of it. And it notes what you did, when you did it, and what the change was. In particular, it shows you the previous state. You know the hash it was pre that this particular reference was previously pointing at. This is the big thing. Now, a couple of gotchas here. It doesn't get pushed up to the ser ser server, so no one else can see this. And it's only by, for 90 days by default. 
Um, that means that it will go away, away eventually. Like anything in Git, it's, it's configurable. You can change this, but you only got, ni got 90 days. There is another thing that we're going to talk about a bit later, which is a, a, a something called uh, Clean or, or GC, um, and we'll talk about that next. Uh, can also screw you up. But the simplest level, if you screwed something up, that you've gone, you've You've branched, you've merged, you've rebased, whatever. There is a record of the previous state. And because this, Git doesn't really delete anything, at least not in the Git model. We have tools on top which clean things up. But at a basic level, because objects don't get deleted, they just get moved around and pointers get moved around. That means you can get back to a previous state if you can find out what that state was. And the ref log is, what the, is the, the storage of the history of state. So this is how you get out the worst of the problems. Now, one thing that will screw you up is the next thing, which is how Git will also like to occasionally keep things clean. This is where the theory breaks down. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit about some of the side effects of this. One of the things happens is if you've got a content addressable file system and you keep adding files, adding files to it, and branches and throwing branches away, or do add, do add, and do add, and then commit, you've got all these copies of various um, intermediate files that are lying around. They're an awful lot like uh, gar garbage in a JVM. You create objects, you change objects, you throw objects away, and they kind of build up. And eventually, you have to do something about them. So Git has the ability to clean up all the loose ends. There's a side effect of having all the, this, this acyclic graph, very much like a, um, an object tree inside the JVM. And surprisingly enough, it's called the same thing, GC, gar garbage collection. Garbage collection is Git's ability to clean up after all these changes. The nature of Git, the Git model, will create a lot of intermediate objects that are no longer of interest. So what happens is uh, Git can, will run GC. You can run it by hand, but it will also run it at certain times, most notably when you're doing anything over the network, because it wants to clean that up first. Um, so we can see here, I've forced a certain situation. Um, git reset, I've done that thing I did before, but I've deliberately screwed myself up. I've done a git gc, and prune all is basically says force it, do everything, just ignore any of the rules we have about not destroying da uh, data, and this is what happens, the object gets taken away, because it has no, nothing pointing to it anymore, very much like the JVM. If you have an object and something is pointing to it, it's live. If it no longer has anything pointing to it, it's dead and is eligible for GC. However, unlike, or sorry, I should say like the JVM, there are certain grace periods. Um, in particular, um, Git will not delete anything <laughs> until it's two weeks old. So in, co in corresponds with the ref log and the, um, the grace period with the GC, you have effectively two weeks to clean up or to fix up any issues you have. Now, that's generally plenty of time because if you screwed up that badly, you're going to find out pretty quickly. Uh, but So you have a certain grace period for cleaning up the, any of these issues that you have. There's also another thing that Git, uh, GC does. I was almost loath to talk about it because it's not really important in the context of what we're talking about right now. What I'm about to tell you does not fundamentally alter the model of Git, but it kind of explains a few things and answers a few questions preemptively. When you do a GC, Git will do something called a pack. Now, the earliest versions of Git were optimized a certain way. Linus Torvalds basically being a fundamental um, realization or, you know, to, or, you know uh, leverage some knowledge or some facts that have been true for some time, which is that disk space is exceedingly cheap nowadays. And it's better to have a bunch of objects in intermediate states that are very heavy on the disk space if it gives you flexibility and speed in terms of manipulating those objects. Now the problem is that breaks down the moment you hit the network. So it also hits down, um, breaks down when you have a project as large as the Linux kernel. So, there is a, another state internally to Git called a pack file. This does the things that subversion did up front. The problem with the subversion model from the ground up was always that it only ever stored the differences between files. That made it very hard 
to, for instance, rewind history and delete content from your history, which sounds like something you shouldn't do but until you've checked in the password file to the company and pushed it up onto a public repository. That has happened. Um, now, the pack file itself is kind of interesting. I'll just show it to you briefly. Um, this is into the nerd territory. If we do a git gc, um, fingers in the United States now all of our objects have disappeared. However, we've gained um, three files. One is pack, which is a list of the available pack files, and a pair of <coughs> big objects. One of which is a pack file, which is literally the bi binary compressed, the, the results of the al algorithm, and the IDX, um, which is a, f a metadata file which points into the pack file that points out where to start finding da data on any given object. Now, if you ever worked with databases, and particularly something like the Berkeley D DB, this will look very familiar to you, because this is how databases work on disk at the simplest level. They tend to be big binary blobs and an index file that tells you how to decode that blob in the most effective way. Now, the actual format of the pack file is esoteric and something of a talk in and of itself. <laughs> Suffice to say, it was made up by Linus Torvalds on the fly. The documentation for it was originally, or it still is, an email he sent to the list when somebody went, what the hell is this? Um, and he basically did a, a, date, a, a mind dump of his thinking around, around it. Um, and somebody has copied that file into the Git um, docs repository, and that's pretty much the documentation for it at this point. It is exceedingly esoteric. It is extremely optimized to um, minimize the seek times for any given object on spinning disks in a modern PC. This is written by an operating systems guy. There's no two ways about, about this. Um, if you're, if you're, you like this kind of thing, I recommend going to have a look at it. It's exceedingly interesting. but. Um, it is uh, not important at this point. This does not fundamentally change the nature of the internal Git model any more than a image being um, turned into a PNG fundamentally changes the image. Um, it's just a form of compression. So I didn't want to get too far into that, but it is kind of interesting. And if you do go and poke around inside your doc .git files afterwards, you should probably be aware that this is happening. So that is another level. We have dealt with objects and trees and commits, and we have dealt with references which point to objects, and we've explained how sometimes those objects need to be clean, cleaned up and what the rules around them are, and the grace period, and how you can use that grace period. Now we're going to jump up another level. It's not really another level, but it is in terms of abstraction. Branches are not a lot of use by themselves. You can branch very, very easily indeed, but at some point you, are, you theoretically want to bring those changes back into the mainstream of development. And this is where we do the merge. The merge is very, very powerful inside Git. Um, at its simplest le uh, level, a merge is nothing more than a Git commit with multiple parents. So, what happens is you have a stream of development. They diverge over time. They need to be reconciled. Git runs some algorithms, which I'll talk about in a bit. There are many of them, and you can add your own, that reconcile these differences. At that point, you need an additional commit to say two things. One, this is the commit that reconciled these two differences. And two, this is where the two differences came from, the two streams. So a Git commit can have two parents, and that defines where those commits came from and gives you its history. Now, this instantly is why you can, once you've done a merge, you can delete a branch because you'll never actually lose that data. Because the, the parent commit points back to the original branch, it ha it's not an orphan, it actually has a parent, therefore it will never be removed. If you walk back through the history of a Git repository, you can always see the points where the branches merged together. This is because of the two pa parents rule. So if you delete a branch after you have merged it, you're not really deleting it, you're just throwing away the reference, that's all. The, the, the ref that points to the last point, that feature up there, it just goes away. But the actual true state can be walked back. You can go walk back through the history again. Uh, just give you a quick look at this. This is the metadata. Um, 
this is a particular commit, um, and we're gonna we're just gonna use a cat file, a git cat file, to show you the contents of it. So that just decompresses it and spits it out. And we can see it has two pa parents. A normal commit will have one parent. It can have two two parents. It can actually have any number of parents if you want to. There's something called an octopus merge, which will take multiple different um, bra branches and merge them in down into one. It's a tricky beast, but it has its place, and I'll talk a bit th about that in a bit. There is one exception to this rule, though, as there, as there always is an exception. Um, something called a fast forward merge. Now, that went by pretty quickly, so let's have a look at it again. If you create a branch and you work on that branch and you go to merge it back onto the source branch, the place you branch from, but nothing's happened on that previous branch, did a branch ever really occur? Did a tree in the forest, bear shit in the woods, etc., etc. Um, so, say you really, really don't want to have to do any extra work and you're obsessed with um, speed and performance, as, say, the Git developers often are, how can you, how can you get out of that? How can you um, uh, utilize this? Well, the answer, of course, is that you don't. You just do what's called a fast-forward merge. You pretend it never happened. Now, this is good if you like a clean history. This is bad if you are the sort of person who sees this as destruction of data. Um, I lean towards a second. What you can do, I haven't shown you this here, but there is a, com uh, there is a flag for merge that says no FF, no fast forward. And what will happen in that case, it won't do the fast forward merge, it will create a dummy merge commit that does literally nothing except has two parents. So that's how you get out of that situation. Some people like a clean history. Some people like a true history. Some people would like a true history, but they don't want the history to be shown to the customers because the customers always keep asking questions about why were all these bugs in the system before. So which unfortunately is a question I actually get quite a lot. Um, so there is places for, for both. It's also possible to coerce the system into doing a fast-forward merge, even though there has been a divergence of the, the true trees. And we'll talk a bit about that in a bit. I want to touch briefly on about actually how a merge is actually done. Unfortunately, I can't go again. So I keep to say this quite a lot, unfortunately, in this talk. Um, I can't go deep, deep into this because it is actually a talk to itself. Um, the thing is, Git has multiple ways of resolving these changes. Now, traditionally, if you use something like subversion or any kind of or normal patch commands, you'd have something to call use a system called resolve. However, this has proved not to be great under the Git world. What Git uses by default is something called recursive. Now, the cool thing about the recursive merge is it's Git smart. The reason why subversions merging was terrible to the point where people just would not do it was because subversion had no concept of the history. It had no concept of where a change came from. So what happened, it would have to kind of just take two completely different files which, and then kind of go smoosh and try and work them out. What Git does with the recursive merge, it walks back through the histories of both of the br br branches and recursively applies changes up the tree. In fact, even if you do cross merges and so, so on, um, and you know you, you do a branch and then merge and merge and merge and merge and merge and then finally merge back to the, to the original tree, Git is aware of these facts and can make intelligent decisions about them. So by default, recursive merge is the one that is used by in Git. This has been exceedingly battle tested in the Linux kernel, which is probably one of the most complex and active pro projects in the world. Um, but there are other ones as well. I mentioned the octopus merge. If you have a whole bunch of different br branches, you want to pull them together into one single branch. Um, you can use the octopus merge. Now, this will only really work if those branches have absolutely no commits, uh, no, no conflicts against them at all. Um, there's not many places where that happens. If you have a whole bunch of submodules and you want to pull them in, and they don't have any o uh, o overlap, that would work. We actually use it in our blogging system. We have a blogging system where basically each person creates a branch and we start writing in our own little directory um, for our individual blog post. 
And then because what happens is we push the branches up and we push them out to a staging system automatically. Now, what would happen if I make a, a, write a blog post and push it up there on my branch and Tim writes a blog post and pushes it up on his branch, what happens? Each one overwrites the previous one up on a staging server. So what happens is when we push the staging server, we do an octopus merge, pull in all current eligible blog posts and push them all up at the same time. This works because of the way we've structured the blogging system is each person's working their own little subdirectory. If you have any conflicts, octopus merge will get messy very quickly. Um, another one is ours. This is a, an interesting one where you want to throw away a complete piece of history um, and replace it with another, but acknowledge that you have done that. What classic would be if you've got a long-running uh, long version 2 of your application, and meanwhile version 3 has gone off, and it's been you know, merging in all the fixes and everything else that's coming from the main branch, but you go, right, version 3 is out there, and it is now the master branch, you can do that. You don't try and merge in and reconcile the two code bases. You say this code base is now the canonical code base, merge it in, pretend this previous history didn't happen, but acknowledge it is there. It's a way of completely replacing one set of changes with another. Subtree is uh, the equivalent of Git's closest equivalent to the externs in subversion, a way of pulling in other Git trees as a, as a sub-module of yours. Um, that's kind of handy when you want to, for instance, um, check li li pull li libraries into your tree for safe key keeping, but you want to acknowledge where they came, came from. Um, the other one is, is you can actually supply any of your own. Now, this is where it gets interesting. If you, say, have some internal binary format that you want to check into Git, and you want to be able to reconcile changes. So if it's a tree-based binary format, potentially, even though it looks like a blob of, of nothing to Git, you may know that, well, I happen to know that I can blow this out into a DOM, reconcile the differences, and recompress it back down to a binary file again. A great example of doing this would actually be something that was an XML merge. XML files look like text files, but you can make a whole bunch of cha changes to them that are actually really separate changes, but look like they're overwriting completely different uh, bits of the file, or, or overwriting the same parts of the file by, by line. Because, a, particularly if you've got they're automatically generated by a tool. So if you do that, you can walk the tree, blow both trees up, walk the tree, um, reconcile the differences, and then um, spit out a new XML file. Um, so this is where you can actually add a custom system in, uh, in there. So this, I want to talk a bit about the merge str strategies. Uh, very powerful, and the reason it's very powerful in Git is because Git keeps its history around. This is very important. Git keeps everything to a, to a large degree. Um, and if something is still relevant, it will keep all history around, and therefore you can use, use that. Now, that said, Git can destroy history, or you can tell Git to destroy history, or rewrite history, more importantly. So our old friend, the re rebase. Who's used rebase at some point? Who fucked it up? There you go. Get a, bit, get a bit, bit more truth out now. What is a rebase? A rebase is the ability to replay commits. That is pretty much the core of it. So what happens is, say we are that person that doesn't actually like the true history. Say that this is a person who wants a completely clean tree, no branches, at least not in what is delivered to the customer. There are people, I've talked to them at conferences, who have legitimate needs for doing this. It's not something we recommend internally at Atlassian. We prefer to keep all history. We have no FF as a rule. But there are reasons for doing this. There are also reasons for you know, other practical reasons, and um, it is quite a powerful idea, and I'll show you why in a bit. But at its simplest uh, level, rebates should really be called replay. Because what it does is it changes the history. It pretends that a branch came from somewhere else. Now, because hashes, the history of um, the commits is encoded in the hash, it has to rewrite every one of those commits as it goes along. So at the simplest level is this. It basically replays each commit, performing a mini merge if it needs to, and then updates the ref to point to it. Now, this is how you would f create a uh, perfectly clean tree if you'd done a branch and been working in parallel. You would then want to do a re rebase and then do the commit, because the commit will, will basically fast forward and it will look like the branch never happened, um, if you so wish. 
There are also some powerful ideas that come from this. One of the reasons why Rebase is used is not really because of this. It's because if you're replaying history, you have the ability to um, change history. You can do things at this point. You can say, well, I actually want these two commits to be one commit. I want to split it into multiple commits, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do some other really interesting things with this. Um, but you can also screw things up quite class uh, classically as well. So finally, we're going to come to the, the hook that I originally put in, which is um, how to get out of trouble with the, the knowledge we just gained. How many people have seen this before? Shit, it really must have been Australia. So, okay, so this is the TV advert for the original, or not the original, the um, 1998 or so uh, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. If you played that, you'll get this joke. <laughs> uh, apparently, it only played in Australia because I've not been show, sh showing this around all around the world and no one seems to, to, to get it. So, let's go back to our old friends, Reset Hard. You fucked up. You did it. You did a reset hard. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. I've seen it. I've seen this. So, so, so this on, on the internet once. What could possibly go wrong? Right? You fucked up. You've reset. You've gone, oh dear, I should not have done that. How do I get out of it? Well, this is all this now. There's nothing pointing to this one here anymore. All it is is a hash floating in the history, waiting to be GC'd. How are you going to get out of that? Anyone want to take a guess? Oh, yeah, I told you. Really, don't I? Um, shouldn't have done that, should I? It's all of the fun. Your ref log. You go, ref log. I've actually done this recently. It is, it is no shame in this as long as you know how to get out of it. Um, we know that we moved the head. We know we moved one back. We all going to look at what the previous one was. We're going to discard the, the latest one. We know that the commit add B is the one that we want. We've got the hash it points to. As I said, when you do a reset, you don't have to give it a, uh, um, a, a reference. You don't have to give it um, one of those magic uh, little reference language that they've created. You can just use reset again. You look up whatever the hash was previously, and you just reset to that. Simple as that. OK, so the other one is you've done a reset. Um, you've done a, a re rebase. Great. Rebase. Sounds good. Want a clean history. Right. Boom. You're, you've broken the build. One of those commits that you've replayed has broken. Which one was it? Now, you can go back and try and do um, um, manually recreate this, or you can use your perfect 100% coverage build system. Right? You've all got your tests sort of running at 100% coverage, right? Yeah, you know, you're all good. Well, we know what we know what the state was previously. We can go back to the ref log. We can find out what what state we were in before we did that re rebase. Then we're going to do a little trick. As I say, if you're replaying history, you can change history, or you can interject and examine history. In particular, git rebase has an exec command. What exec does? It means after each step of the rebase, run this command. That command could be anything. But the most sensible thing to do is to do make test. So if you've broken the build, you've broken your test at some point, you tell Git, please replay what I did, but do each step along the way, run the tests. If it comes back with an error, stop. And at that point, I know what to, re to fix. Git will actually work with you on this. It will go, right, fix whatever you need to fix, and then commit it and do c rebase continue, and it will just carry on its merry way. So this is one way of fixing the rebase. Another one I'm going to show, show you um, is more for when you've... Um, it's actually more interesting. I'm um, using an example of rebase here. But it's also interesting if you have some sort of long-lived regression, as in something that's snuck in somewhere in your history but hasn't shown up until recently. This doesn't happen very often um, so much in the normal commercial enterprise programming environment, but it does happen a lot in the Linux kernel where you might find six months later that somebody's commit has broken against a particularly obscure piece of hardware only made in hung Hungary in 1996 kind of thing. So how do you get out of that? How do you find out which point in the history 
that a a, a break a breakage was into uh, was brought into your tree. Well, there's a cool thing that's used a lot in the Linux kernel, um, which is bisect. Bisect basically does something you can do manually yourself. So the sensible thing to do if you were going to try and debug a problem that's snuck in somewhere and you're trying to triage it, is you find a, a version of the system that you know is good, you find a version of the system you know is bad, and then just try keep trying all of the changes in between. Well, what Git Bisect will do is automate that for you. You tell Bisect, here is a known good point, here is a known ba bad point. Go and see if you can find out what the difference is. Um, and it will actually do that. You, know, you can do that manually, run the test by hand if it's a hardware-based issue, or you can use the will make test again, and that will find it. And it will point out and stop at the point where the breakage occurred. There's a whole bunch of other little gotchas and screw-ups that I could show you here. Um, I've got five minutes left. I want to show you a little cool, cool thing. So that one, one weird trick that you've got to have nowadays. So I'm going to show you how to do powers of invisibility inside Git. Now this, is a, this seems a bit esoteric, but it's actually used in a couple of interesting play places. We're going to show you how to hide stuff inside Git using the knowledge we've already gained. Let's say we want to have an object. We want it to float there. It has content. Only we know what it is. Only we know what its na name is. And it won't show up in any normal history. Why would we want to do that? Well, we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, how would you do that? Well, we kind of know that these ex commands must exist. We know that the guilt is, guilt is built on top of abstractions, and we know that there must be some tool for working at this lower level rather than the higher level. So let's go and have a look at this. I, I literally, when I wrote this bit, I literally know, didn't know what those commands were, but I knew they must exist, so I went and worked it out. There's a command called hash object. That will tell you what the hash of a given file will be if you were to write it into Git. But also, because why the hell wouldn't you just reuse that, there's a, mi a minus W flag, which will actually write the files into the Git tree. That means you have this object just sitting there, floating in the Git tree. No parents, no children, no nothing. However, what will happen to that after two weeks? Anyone? Garbage collected, because it has no references, same as it would be in the J JVM. But, so, but there's a way around that. We know that anything with something pointing to it is not um, e uh, eligible for garbage collection, same as in the JVM. So we also want to create a tag. Simple as that. We know what the hash is. They told us when we created the object. We know we can create a tag, a com and we, as it happens, we, I, I assumed that if I put tag name and then the hash afterwards, it would probably create a tag with that hash. And it turns out it could be completely true. I was correct. So now we have a completely hidden object with no history associated with it except a floating tag that could mean anything. How do we get this out, though? Would you lose the name of the object then? Uh, you would. You wouldn't, you wouldn't keep the metadata around. No. Uh, that, that's up to you. Um, the idea is that this, that this is never written to disk. Um, so this is purely floating there. It's, it, it is pure da uh, data, no metadata. The, data is in your, the metadata is in your head. Or you could actually encode it into the tag if you wanted to. There's no reason why you couldn't actually build up. You couldn't then create a tree on top of pointing that object and then a, f a reference to that tree. They, those, those commands, I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, those commands are there. They, you, you consider it an exercise afterwards, go and find out what they are. How can you get this out, though? Well, we assume there must be some way of looking at objects. There is. There's a cat file. It can actually take hashes. It can take whatever. Um, a minus p is pretty prince. It goes well. This probably looks like a. This looks kind of like a, um, a text file. So we'll use that. So this is the content of the file. Uh, this is the Old Smith family Pachin. Pachin, if you don't know, is basically Irish vodka. Um, the reason why my name is Smith when I'm I I I I Irish is probably related to the fact that we used to brew Pachin, which is illegal in Ireland. Um, and this isn't actually all that esoteric. Two things use this. One, if you go into the Git, actual Git repository, and do that, cat file ju ju junio, that actually is junio, the maintainer of Git's public tr um, key, encoded into 
the Git history. It's, it, as, as, I'm sorry, not Git history, it, it, as an object inside the Git repository. Fun fact, when we were converting Bitbucket from Mercurial and adding Git support, this really <laughs> screwed the guys up. Because they were trying to import um, the Git repository. Obviously, that'd be the first thing you try and import. And they were finding all these random objects which didn't have any history and they couldn't work out what the hell was going on. It was blowing up their I import porter. The other way this is used is it's used for, um, by GitHub. I don't want to really mention them because we're, they're, they're, they are competitors, but they're also sort of drinking buddies of ours as well, so we're all over that. That's how they do their pages. You can actually create a whole separate history, two concurrent histories inside Git with completely different files in them different and no, no real relation to each other. So you can actually have multiple histories um, encoded into a single uh, Git repository. There's no reason why you couldn't have 100 different histories of different systems encoded into one Git repository. Not good practice. Um, that's why Lassie didn't take that path when we did our own pages system. But it is, and uh, there, there's a lot of things you can do that you, with Git that you probably haven't even thought about yet. But at this point, I'm getting flashed at, and it's out of time um, for this talk. I'll be hanging around on the, um, on the uh, Atlassian booth, which is there. Uh, feel free to come and talk, talk to me, ask questions. Um, also, uh, John St Stevenson is doing a Birds of a Fe Fe Feather later today, 7.30, I think. Um, and uh, it's about Git, if you're interested in discussing any of the things. But just to, re to recap, that's the, that is Git. That's the simplest level.